Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child using the method of catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. So this episode of the podcast is coming out on January 5th, 2022. I can't believe it's 2022 already, guys. But tomorrow, on January 6th, it will be our two-year anniversary of the podcast. And I am so grateful for each one of you and joining me on this journey with this project. It has been so much fun. I started this project when I was living in the Northeast Mountains of Georgia, and I was kind of isolated and by myself in regards to a catechesis of the Good Shepherd community. And I really craved connecting with other people who were passionate about this work. And I knew that I wasn't alone in that desire. And so this podcast comes out of that desire for community, for connection. And so I'm so grateful for all of you, for all of you all over the world, for connecting with me and being my community and loving this work just as much as I do. Today, we are going to continue our season two journey of exploring all things Montessori as a way of understanding the underpinnings and the influence that Maria Montessori's discoveries of the child had on Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. Today, we're going to dive into this beautiful philosophy of human needs and tendencies. Kathy Yohani is joining us on the podcast, and she's the perfect person to dive into this topic with us. She has a degree from Princeton, specifically on anthropology, which is so perfect for this topic. She's also a formation leader for Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, and she is a certified Montessori guide for the elementary age child. She's perfect. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Kathy, welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. We are so happy to have you. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you, Carrie. Kathy, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and your involvement with Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? Oh, I'd be delighted. I'd be delighted. Um, I have been um, working with Catechesis of the Good Shepherd for over two decades now. Wow. Just feel so blessed to have found it and have been able to share that with my own children um, and with church communities. I uh, had the opportunity to work in a Montessori school uh, for nine years and also to get elementary uh, Montessori training as part of being the catechist in that school. Um, and now I'm working with a small group of people who are um, hoping to start a Catholic Montessori school in our area. Wow. So it's very exci- very exciting. What area? I'm in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Very it's nice. been such a joyful journey yeah. <laughs> um, just to see where the Lord leads uh, through the children. So are you primary and elementary tra- trained or just elementary? Just elementary, That's yeah. Beautiful. And then I'm a formation leader too. So I've had the catechesis of the Good Shepherd training, which is so wonderfully steeped in the Montessori. Mm-hmm. 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 The elementary age child. I mean, I think I've said this before on the podcast that that primary that zero to six, that first playing child is such a beautiful age that we can just dive mm-hmm. into. And that's like, it's almost like that's the goal. Mm-hmm. But I resonate so well with that elementary age child. Like that's where my home kind of naturally falls, especially that level two, that six to nine year old. So, yeah, I think that our brains as adults um, are more like their brains. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes we do. Um, identify more uh, with that second plane child mm-hmm. yeah, from six to 12 for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That's beautiful. Well, Kathy, so we're going to continue this journey down our Montessori road and finding our Montessori roots in our work with catechesis of the good shepherd and how um, to help us kind of live out this work more fully if we understand more of the Montessori philosophy. So I would love to pick your brain as a Montessorian into the Montessori ideas of human tendencies and needs. And I have to say, this is probably one area of Montessori that I know very little about. So I'm really excited to dive into this with you. Yeah, I'm excited too. I'm excited too. Well, could you tell us a little bit about maybe where did this idea or this philosophy of human tendencies and needs come from with Maria Montessori? Yeah. 
Um, well, you know, we all know that Maria Montessori was a doctor, mm -hmm. right? We, we learned that. But she also held a post as a professor of anthropology. And um, I actually studied anthropology when I was in college. So that, you know, really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. I think anthropologists are people who... Um, who are just really interested in cross-cultural similarities and differences. I like mm -hmm. to think of it as applied philosophy. You know, they mm -hmm. ask themselves questions about what it means to be human and, and what we share as humans and then sort of test it by observing in different cultures. And I mm -hmm. think Maria Montessori was really able to do that. We know that she started out working with um, different classes of children, economic classes in Italy. And then her, as her work spread, she got to see children in different cultures. And she even spent um, a good chunk of time in, in India in a very different culture. And she began to notice these things that, um, that were the same working in these different places. Um, and so uh, that the idea of human tendencies worked its way into her writing and her thinking, I think, just because she was an observer of, of humanity. So she wrote a little bit about it, but the real sort of quintessential um, text about human tendencies came um, through her son, Mario. And it was really after her death that he sort of packaged this idea of human tendencies for us. In 1956, he gave a lecture mm -hmm. um, that would be published as a little booklet that explained the human tendencies. Um, it's called The Human Tendencies in Montessori Education, and it's, it's published by AMI. And it's just a short little volume, but... He really um, kind of tried to explain his mother's thinking on it. Mm -hmm. um, and he presents a, a chart of interdependency, which is sort of classic in the Montessori ele elementary classroom that kind of shows how the, the natural world and the social world are connected. And, and he also talks a lot about fundamental human needs, which is sort of the linchpin for, for so much of the Montessori elementary curriculum. Mm -hmm. But he did that by talking about these natural human tendencies um, and how God has in, endowed humans with these sort of urges towards certain types of activities that really have brought humanity to where we are today and that his idea was studying that would give children such a an appreciation both for God and for humanity mm. and would they be filled with gratitude and and that in and of itself would inspire them and inspire their research and their work mm -hmm. so so what I hear is that Human tendencies are kind of the universal across culture, but also across like economic status and everything that all humans share, like the human, the, the desires within us, the tendencies yeah. within us, the needs within us that we all share. And then by exploring those, we kind of understand more about who we are and where we came from. Is that, am I? Yeah, I think that's correctly? a great that's a great way of putting it. Yeah. And, and his point in the article was, was that um, an education system that works with these human tendencies rather than mm. one that stifles the human tendencies will, you won't have to <laughs> induce the children to learn right. or bribe the children to learn that right. this, that this will be a natural process. And right. so, you know, that's what the Montessori education is built on, but also it's what our atria right. um, is built on so that we, we, you know, it's, it's not, um, it's not hard to get children to wonder about these great mysteries of our faith right. because we're working with their human tendencies. By understanding more about the person sitting in front of us, it's kind of like going with the tide instead of against it. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. So can you tell us what are the human tendencies that, that they talked about? Yeah. So, um, so these human tendencies are sort of dynamic and interrelated, um, and they're these, these characteristics that can be observed throughout history and in individual humans and within cultures. Um, I think it's important for us to know that, that there is no real set number of these tendencies. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go online and look at, you know, um, websites for different Montessori schools and, you know, in their little sections that say, what is Montessori, they might list different numbers and different names for the human tendencies, anywhere from like 10 different human tendencies to I've seen up to 14. Um, and that's because they're kind of interrelated. And so, um, so some people, you know, classify them one way or, 
or another. He Mario in his lecture, which was published, he did name and he did and it was italicized in the text several of these human tendencies, but but they do overlap. And the goal here is really just to think how they are operative. But if we wanted to kind of make a list, we would say that the human tendencies include exploration, um, orientation or order. There's a tendency towards observation, uh, abstraction, and imagination. We see that at work so much in that second plain child. Mm -hmm. um, there's a tendency towards perfection, uh, activity, work, manipulation. So you can see how those could, you know, be overlapping there. Um, exactness, self-control, and communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's quite a list. It, it is. It is. So yeah, I think um, if we can see ourselves as working with those human tendencies, then things just are easy for the children to, to grow and develop. Well, what does that mean to work with the human tendencies? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so that means just providing for these natural processes to flourish within our prepared environment. So for example, if we were to say orientation as one of the human tendencies, we know that we start our atrium year with an orientation to the atrium, mm -hmm. right? We walk the children through, walk them around, we end up at our prayer table, but so that they can see um, how the room is set up and where the bathroom is and things like mm -hmm. that. That sort mm -hmm. of orientation is the child asking, well, where do I fit in? So, so very in a very physical sense, we do that. Um, in our atrium, but also kind of in a spiritual sense, they're asking, where do I fit in to the kingdom of God? Mm -hmm. Where do I fit into God's plan? And certainly, uh, you know, with our, our blue strip and our blank page and, oh, in level three, we even have a work called the kingdom of God and my place in it, mm -hmm. right? So we're helping them on a spiritual level to orient themselves, um, in a cosmic sense, but mm -hmm. also, uh, you know, in a very physical sense, we're helping, especially the level one child to orient to our very physical environment and figure out where do I fit in? Mm -hmm. um, I think if you think about the atrium and you think about the geography works that we have and the timelines, those are all aimed at orientation. They're helping that, that sort of human tendency that the child, you know, is driven to figure out where in time, where in space, well, we're, we're helping them. We're giving them the tools to meet their needs uh, using that human tendency. Mm. I've never thought about the geography work in that way, in a, in a sense of orienting themselves in the connection to the world, but then also in connection to Jesus on in the world. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Oh, and maybe you've had this experience when we show them that, that globe that um, with the dot on the Holy mm -hmm. Land of Israel, what did they always want to know? <laughs> like, Where am I? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So, um, so it's so it's so beautiful to think that oh, this this just works so beautifully with the children because it's working with their human tendencies. Mm -hmm. And it yeah. makes sense, you know. I I know as in for myself, but I also know for my children that if I orient us in maybe like the day in a non physical way, so like today, this is what it's going to look like. This is what we're doing today. This is what we're doing for the next hour. Or, you know, whenever you're going to leave something fun, you're like, okay, we're going to leave in 10 minutes. So kind of like an orient of time, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, it really helps me and it helps my children to have more peace in yes. what's happening. And then I also feel like if you can orient yourself in that time and place, like this is where we're at, or this is what the next hour looks like of our life. There's like a freedom to get creative. There's a freedom to grow there more because you are secure in your orientation of time and place. Yeah, I, I think that's such a great example. Um, and you can see then how that orientation is connected to order, right? Right. Um, and so, you know, you're saying, okay, this is what's going to happen in the next hour of time. And when we have our atrium sessions, they follow a predictable order um, right. to some extent. And you're right, there's creativity and there's fluidity within that order. But that gives the child security 
um, so that they they do have that sense of, okay, well, this is my work time and I know we'll gather um, for for prayer and song. You know, and they, they know what to expect. And you're right. That's, that's so important too, that you just naturally as a mother meet those human tendencies, those deep needs that are within your child. And, um, and we try and do that in the atrium too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's really neat. I can think about um, history and you can look at all the different stories that we've been told throughout history, especially I think in like the level three atrium and we talk about the plan of God and all the different civilizations and how these different tendencies that you just lifted up exploration and self-control and self-perfection and work and communication, like those really are universal. You hear about, those are like almost the main pillars of each of the different civilizations that we've learned about in history, that those are the things that each of them need in order to be a thriving civilization or one that can um, at least tell their story throughout time. Yeah, that's such a good point. And in in Mario Montessori's lecture, he he talks about that. I think that's kind of where he abstracts them from in the first place. He says, you know, just imagine these early humans um, and they they don't have fur and they don't have claws and, you know, whatever, but they do have these needs for survival. And so what will they do? Well, they'll explore to find good food sources. So exploration is a human tendency, but they don't want to get lost. (laughs) So they'll orient themselves, you know, along the way so they can find themselves their Mm -hmm. way back. Mm -hmm. And then they'll work to make a tool um, by manipulating stone and manipulation, again, is a a human tendency, stone or wood, maybe making a tool or something. And where does the idea for that tool come from? Well, maybe observation and abstraction. Maybe they've seen the tusks on an animal and how those tusks work and they think, oh, maybe I can make something like that. So they use their imagination and they design something. And then they maybe repeatedly Mm -hmm. (laughs) design it and hone that and experience. So there's that repetition and exactness and Mm -hmm. perfection that's coming through. And then they'll want to share their work and communicate about it. And just like you, Carrie, it makes me think of some of the works in our atrium, like especially in the level three atrium where we we have those sort of discoveries that are on that big plan of God and the inventions that are on that big plan of God. Um, all of those things like discovering, um, you know, agriculture and domesticating the dog and um, creating the wheel, all those things that mm-hmm. are on our timeline. Well, those are the results of the human tendencies in, in action. And so you're right. These are observable in history. To me, what's really amazing is that they're also observable in individual development. So, you know, you might have Um, an early human who had to figure out how to make warm clothes for himself or herself. And Mm -hmm. the same human needs apply to, uh, you know, a three-year-old or a four-year-old today has to figure out how to to clothe themselves, right? So in a Montessori classroom, you'll have dressing frames where they'll learn to button or to zipper or maybe to tie their shoes. Um, And they'll, they'll put those, I mean, obviously they're not, you know, making a, a, you know, a garment out of animal skins or something like that, but it's that's those same needs and then the same tendencies, they will be manipulating, they will be repeating that repetition. Um, They'll be seeking that perfection. Um, And so we see these same tendencies that gave rise to humanity's success being lived out in the developing uh, child, which I think is, is really fascinating. That is Um, fascinating. So it's necessary for the children to kind of go through a version of what humanity has gone through, through history. I I think that's, I think that's kind of baked into the Montessori, um, ideas so that just so that they can be filled with an awe and appreciation as mario says to appreciate god and humanity um i know uh i've 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 heard of some um, montessori guides who you know when they're doing gardening with children at first they'll have the children lug buckets of water over (laughs) Mm -hmm. um so that children can get that experience and then later they would introduce like a hose or something Mm -hmm. like that just Mm -hmm. so that the child himself has to or herself has to go through that process that early humans must have had to go through to figure out how do I problem solve yeah Um, and how can I make this better and that I think is something that 
um, Mario Montessori says that that we're these creatures that always want to make things better, and right. we always want to to perfect something. Oh, how can I make it faster or um, easier more or more accessible? Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet the children who had to load those buckets of water really appreciated the hose after they had to do that. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> Going through I that process so. creates a sense of appreciation. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely, yeah. So do the human tendencies look the same in each of the different planes of development? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, they actually operate differently before and after age six. And uh, in his book, Mario really concentrates on the elementary age. But, um, but we can say certain things about you know what we know about our level one children in the atrium or our first plane children. Um, that for them, their human tendencies are causing them to explore in a sensorial way. Mm -hmm. So um, we mm -hmm. have all those works that allow them to do that. But really what they're absorbing is their immediate environment. And the difference in the second plane is that the human tendencies are um, causing the child to explore the universe now. Mm -hmm. Now the child is this imaginative explorer and wants to know everything about everything. You know, <laughs> literally the sky is the limit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they want to know about, you know, the beginnings of the universe and down to the, the things that are in a cell, you know. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's the difference there is that we think about these sensitive periods and and, and that sort of defining the first plane, but really in the second plane, it's these human tendencies that are driving them to orient themselves with what we would call a cosmic curriculum. Mm. Just, you know, looking at everything and seeing the interrelatedness of it. That's beautiful. And then in the, which plane is it? I guess it's the third and the fourth plane, whenever the human is, is working like Montessori had them like working on farms and really doing hands on work and those kind of things. You can really yes. see that like desire for work and um, creativity and all of those things in a much bigger scale the, you know, you right. have the, the level one child or the, the first plane child who's, who's sitting there buttoning on a dressing frame, but then you have that level three child who's out building their own garden or, you know, making their own wooden toys or, whatever it is that they're, that they've decided fills their cup, but um, yes, just kind of yeah. on a much bigger scale. Yeah, exactly. And again, living through that history, that human history of, yeah. you know, she wanted people to be on the, on the farm. So to have that connection with nature, um, with animals, with animal husbandry, with gardening, as you mentioned, with craft, um, mm -hmm. you know, crafts, working with wooden tools and building things. So really, we might use the, the theological term incarnating, really incarnating human history in mm -hmm. the individual so that all of that becomes part of, of that third plane child. And then, you know, that fourth plane, um, of that adulthood finding their, their personal mission. Um, yeah. And, and you can see how all those human tendencies, exploration and communication and orientation and repetition and perfection could just help the fourth plane, you know, the, the, the person to really find their place, their personal work, their purpose uh, right. within our world. Right. So this idea of human tendencies and needs, where does this fit into our work in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd? Why is it important for us to understand yeah. this? Well, um, I think it's really baked into, you know, to our works, we can we can certainly see that. I like to think especially about exploration, mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of what can I discover? Yeah. And for the for the level one child, they're using their senses, obviously, and they're discovering things. Um, but we're also inviting their natural curiosity. And I think the way that we present scripture and liturgy, and we're always asking questions, we're mm -hmm. not lecturing um, at level one or two or three, we're asking questions. I think that invites the child to, to discover. And especially if we, um, you know, if we adopt that stance of humility and we can convey to the child that we're discovering along with them, it just opens their hearts to really pondering these things as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, I think that uh, human tendency of exploration is really, um, baked in to, to what, our, to our work. Yeah, um, I yeah. think, 
Oh, I think, you know, we can look at probably any material. You could look at the books of the Bible material in level two and think about how that appeals to a sense of order with the children taking them out and putting them back in in order and, and how that, you know, how, how much they enjoy doing that and how mm. that gives them the security you were talking about earlier mm. with that sense of order. You know, I think that that's, that's a beautiful thing just to look at that. Uh, communication is one of the human tendencies and, and we certainly foster communication within our, our um, atria, certainly with discussions. We're always inviting everyone to uh, say what they think and what they feel and to pray together. I think our Mm -hmm. artwork really encourages communication. Sometimes children can communicate something in their art that they maybe can't even articulate in words. Mm -hmm. We offer song as a way of communicating um, and gesture. You know, when we unpack the different gestures that that we are, or prayer postures we might use at mass, that's a way of communicating mm-hmm. as well. And then I think so importantly, the atrium at whatever level, one, two, or three, is a place where we communicate not just with other humans, but with the God who loves us. And so to have time and space for that vertical communication mm-hmm. is just really, um, really beautiful. The human tendencies are so important with the way that our atria function Mm -hmm. you know obviously we um, we have hands-on work so manipulation we give our short presentations but uh, you know the the majority of the time is given to the child's work with it and that just feeds that that human tendency for work and activity Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and repetition we allow them to repeat the works as often as they need to and of course we see at level one you know, a repetition towards building the inner self, but at level two and three, they still need the repetition, but they want repetition with variety. So right. a little bit, a little bit different. They think they know it all. <laughs> right. Um, so we have similar works where they're talking about the same thing, but exactly in five different ways so that they don't yes. feel like they're doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. 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 And even the human tendency towards abstraction, I think you know, from a very early age, we are um, fostering that. We know that the young child, the level one child is more concrete and is just, you know, that abstraction only emerges in them. But, um, but we're, you know, when we're asking about the mustard seed parable, well, what is Jesus trying to tell us? We're opening the door to abstraction there, right? So that they can see these parables exist on different levels on a, you know, very, obvious level and then on a spiritual level. So Mm -hmm. from a very early age, we're inviting the child to grow in that human tendency of abstraction. And then, you know, by the time they get to level two and level three, I, I'm sure you have had this experience too, but I'm just floored by the connections that they make and the depth of their, their thinking about these things. So, right. So Carrie, I know from listening to the podcast that you have done work in Haiti Mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering, you know, that's a a different culture. And I'm just wondering, did you see some of these, you know, can you in your mind picture some of the work that you did in the atrium in Haiti? And did you see some of these tendencies at work there? Yes, definitely. It's interesting how at the very beginning you were talking about Maria and Mario's work with different people across different economic backgrounds, but then also when they went to India and different countries, Mm -hmm. cross culture backgrounds. And then through those experiences, God opened their eyes to this universality of humanity. And I can totally relate to that feeling because I Mm -hmm. remember we're living in Haiti feeling like there are these basic core things that we all as humans need. And it doesn't matter if you grew up in a third world country or in an, in a developed country, those core needs do not change. And there's also like an equal amount of like those needs being met and not met across. Mm-hmm. I mean, it doesn't yeah. matter if you were born in a third world country or a developing country or a developed country. Um, there's, there's kind of a universal lack of the needs being met and needs being met, if that makes sense, what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, and what I mean is like, like a desire to be known, a desire to be loved. And those things come by the interactions that we have with the people around us and our interactions with God. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Don't, those don't necessarily go specifically with human tendencies. But we also saw, I remember also seeing children, they were so creative because, you know, they didn't have a toy box at home full of random toys. So right. they would use um, empty soda bottles, like uh-huh. plastic soda bottles, and then the lids from the soda bottles and sticks they'd find on the ground and a piece of string. And they using all those materials, they would make cars and then they would race their cars oh. from with each other. Or they would make kites out of plastic bags and string and sticks from the ground or um, slingshots that they would that they would use. And there's their creativity with using whatever was in front of them was so amazing. But all children do that. All yes. children find whatever's in front of them, whether it's you know, a, a toy you bought from the store or sticks in the yard. And they will create whatever it is that's in their mind that they want to create. They have the, mm-hmm. there's this universal, that imaginative aspect of that human tendency that you were talking about of, what was, what is it that you called it? You called it abstraction and imagination. Yeah. You know, I totally see that in all children. Yeah. And all children. Well, it sounds like there was manipulation at work there and probably exactness. They probably tried a certain model of their mm-hmm. car and then tried a faster one too. You know, two things struck me about about what you were just saying about the children that you worked with in Haiti. Um, Mario Montessori talks about his, you know, he goes through this kind of thought experiment about early humans and he it's it's kind of funny he kind of has them pouting Mm -hmm. (laughs) of you know god you gave you know you gave the animals these great you know skills and these great tools in their bodies and you know you didn't give me this and you know he kind of has them even complaining about even you know even the babies that we make are just little lumps and, you know, and they're dependent on us for 20 years. And so he's kind of tongue in cheek having early humans complain to God about this lack that they have. And yet he turns it around and says that that lack, because God also gave us these human tendencies, it is that lack that, as you say, produces the creativity. Um, Mm -hmm. Yes, that's very true. Yeah. It's, it, it's just a beautiful thing. He says, um, that is why the very great poverty that man had, poverty of bodily equipment, poverty, poverty of guide and instincts, gave him the freedom that enables himself to adapt to any place. This mm-hmm. great wealth of man in his dire poverty was something no other animal possessed, a reasoning intelligence, which enabled him to make use of the abstractions so he it it almost sounds like saint paul (laughs) Mm -hmm. here talking about in the weakness we're made strong by god's grace and um and so it seems like you saw that in action oh definitely it's so true like there's almost layers to benefits to to poverty and and a certain level of poverty what i'm talking about but yeah having less definitely causes you to get more creative that's for Mm -hmm. sure but then also having less causes you to acknowledge that everything is from God. Yes. Which was a really beautiful thing that I saw in Haiti and a gift that they gave me was acknowledging that when I have nothing in front of me and I get food on my table, oh, praise God. God is the reason Mm -hmm. that I have food on this table. And when I have food all the time, you kind of forget that that's a gift from God. Yes. You almost say, or you, you claim it as your own it's because of me that I have food on this table rather than it's because of God that I'm capable of working to have food on my table kind of thing. So, yes, yes. And, and I think Mario spoke to that too in, in his, um, in his book, he, he said, this was his mother's perspective as well, that, that education should lead us to trust in the wisdom of God. And he, he talks about, um, he talks about, oh, like birds that would be eating carrion that they would see when they were in India and how the children were just grossed out by that and thought those birds were <laughs> cursed, you know, and everything like that. And then he he kind of talked about the interrelatedness of it and how, you know, those birds are actually the the garbage collectors. And isn't it great that they're doing this service for us? by And so gradually the children began to see the interrelatedness of the, the natural world and the human world. And, and this is you know, central to the Montessori curriculum for elementary, this chart of interdependencies. And and what Mario shares is that 
eventually the same child who had been grossed out by these uh, these animals says, oh, how clever and good God is. And, and I think what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, sometimes recognizing how clever and good God is, is, is just the best that mm-hmm. we can do if we really have the freedom to follow our human tendencies and see the interrelatedness of our world, then, then that will be our, our prayer, how great and good God is. Yeah. So how clever and good God is. So, yeah. well, so, so you spoke about that, even though if you're in Haiti or you're here in America or wherever you are, you have these same human tendencies, but in what I hear from what we were just talking about is maybe they're fostered a little differently based on your environment. So can yeah. you speak into that a little bit more of maybe if something's off within the community of the children or within the environment? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, we Once we're aware of these human tendencies, we can use them to look at our particular atrium community and say, you know, am I allowing the freedom to pursue these human tendencies here. So if, you know, if you have that experience where something's just a little off in your community of children in your atrium, um, then you can look around at your prepared environment and just say, hmm, is there some way I can grant more freedom in activity or in manipulation? Or am I allowing for enough abstraction or communication? You know, I, I think, you know, one example of this is, Sometimes we might, uh, especially at level two, we might impose on the children a sort of a structure for prayer. Mm -hmm. And then we might say, gosh, why are the children not really praying? (laughs) Why am I not hearing Mm -hmm. sort of spontaneous prayer responses at the end of at the end of presentations or when we gather together for prayer. And part of that might just be the culture of the place that you're working. Maybe the families tend to pray together in a certain way. Um, But maybe it's also that you haven't given them enough freedom in Mm. communication, in that human tendency of communication. So maybe you imposed a structure on it too early and, um, and they're, the, the structure itself doesn't allow for that freedom or that activity or the, that prayer to bubble up from the heart. So we have to, when something seems a little bit off in our atrium, we need to say, gosh, am I giving enough freedom? And I'll always freedom's always balanced with responsibility, but am I giving enough freedom in this area or in that area? And I think Two, uh, you know, if if you have maybe just one or two children that are a little bit off in your atrium, we can look at how the human tendencies are lived out in their life. Maybe, maybe this is a child who has a very strong human tendency towards activity, mm-hmm. and maybe you have an after-school atrium, and and this uh, this child maybe has been sitting in school for six hours at, you know, at a desk. And so they really need to be active. So, you know, can you have them sweep the hall before you unroll the, um, the fatusha or something, something that they can move and be very active um, that might just meet their personal um, human tendencies might meet their personal needs at that point. So, you know, we see, some people might be more communicative than others. So we can mm-hmm. see that there are different different ways that these human tendencies are lived out in any one individual life, mm-hmm. which is why it's such a blessing that in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, we get to be with the children for three years. You know, um, sometimes we follow them too as they get older. So, mm-hmm. but you do get to know the child then, and then you can really get to know where they are is there are they very communicative and they love to talk or they love to draw um or are they more of the the uh silent type but they like to move you know Mm -hmm. all sorts of different varieties there but just always Mm -hmm. thinking about how we can give them freedom balanced with responsibility but freedom in those tendencies it really seems like human tendencies and understanding that can really help with the freedom and discipline aspect of the atrium of being able to manage an atrium with so many children with so many different needs. But maybe like you were just saying, having those off kids or off days, maybe Mm -hmm. um, fully understanding human tendencies might be able to help manage, which I think is one of those things that a lot of us who have gone through formation you know, formation so nice and peaceful and calm. And then we get in the atrium <laughs> with 13 kids and 
and we go, whoa, this is not like what my formation was. Yes. And understanding the human tendency seems to be a great tool for your tool bag of being able to self-assess or assess your environment or assess the child by observation to understand what, okay, what need is not being met right now that this child is behaving in X, Y, Z yeah. um, in order to meet those different needs in a different way for each child. Yeah, I quite agree with you, Carrie. I feel like that's the feedback I get from from formation, but it's not like <laughs> what right. we did in formation when you exactly. have actual children there. And yeah, I think, I think um, a lot of our grace and courtesy uh, can be informed by uh, by understanding the human tendencies and that, that this is just natural within children. So why don't we go with what's natural rather right. than, you know, maybe a lot of us grew up with a, a format that mm-hmm. um, tried to block those human tendencies or stifle them. And so it, right. it's, a, it's a real paradigm shift to think about, oh, how can we work with what's natural in the developing human? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, one thing that kind of blew me away as I was thinking about this, preparing to to chat with you about it, is that Jesus had these human tendencies. Mm. And like that was just like, wow. So Jesus wanted to explore and Jesus, you know, had to orient himself and um, and he sought order and he imagined and he abstracted. And to me, yeah, that that just... Well, I don't think I think enough about the humanity of Jesus sometimes. Right, right. And just to imagine him as a child, the same age of the children that I work with, is it's just always a good thing for me to to ponder. Mm-hmm. What a neat little Bible study that we could do on the life of Jesus and human tendencies and find, yeah. going through his life and identifying different human tendencies and the different stories that are told. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's beautiful. Well, is there anything else about human needs or tendencies that you would like to lift up before we finish? Oh, I think we've covered so much. I, I'm sure that we could probably talk. We probably for, could. We for probably. hours more. But, um, <laughs> but I feel like this is a good, uh, good introduction to something that we can continue to think about as we work with the children. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast, Kathy. I really appreciate you. Oh, my pleasure, Carrie. This has been so much fun. Really, really good. It has. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us this week. I have a link to Mario Montessori's book, very short book, on the human tendencies and Montessori education. I have a link to that in our show notes if you're interested in diving into this topic a little bit more. It's a really short book, so it's a beautiful way to grow in your understanding about the philosophy of human needs and tendencies. I also have links in our show notes to other books that have to do with Montessori, starting with our very own Gianna Gobi's Listening to God with Children, which is the perfect place to start when diving into all things Montessori in light of what we do in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I also have some links to some other episodes that that we've done in the past two years that have to do with Montessori, such as episode four on normalization with Gabriela Perez, episode 30 on freedom and discipline with Claire Paglia, and episode 41 on the elementary age child with Anna Hurdle. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. We would like to thank all the contributing members because you are making this podcast possible. If you would like to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member, please go to cgsusa.org. Thank you all for listening this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.